Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a Starless Interlude. There are seven episodes. This is one of them. The fine mist of rain falling from the sky confounds the windshield wipers of Will McCullough's car. He finds himself distracted by regret for the preemptive glibness of his assessment of the Tottenham match against Wolves in the previous episode, which did indeed end in a turgid 1-1 draw without heroics from either Hyung Min Son or Harry Kane to rescue the three points. Phoenix will never let me live this down, he thinks to himself. He's at the drive through ordering coffee before he knows it. Upon his return, he says as much. Hmm, what are you talking about? Phoenix responds quizzically. Last episode's narrative intro where I rambled about my frustrations surrounding Tottenham Hotspur's performance during the festive fixtures? Oh, that. I think you've dramatically overestimated how much I, or any of our listeners, care about Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, she says dismissively. Will hangs his head dejectedly, unable to find even any joy in Spurs' victory over a local pub team in the FA Cup. We went back to the football well. <laughs> we did. Trust me, it'll pay off. How many times are we going to go back to the football well? It was either that or talk about the coup. Ugh. Football well is great. <laughs> the less said about the events of this week, uh, the better. Moving on, let's talk about a fun and light book that we have been reading together to escape. If you would like an explanation of our Starless Interlude, please refer back to episode one of our Starless Interlude, because I am not doing that again. However, we do have disclaimers. As always, we are in no way affiliated with Erin Morgenstern or her publisher, Anchor Books. And as always, please be kind to us, to yourself, and the authors responsible for the books you love. All righty. The Ballad of Simon and Eleanor. Time crossed is not the same as star crossed. This is the first time we've really gotten to meet the Simon half of this equation. And one thing that we discover is that they seem to be from different time periods. She makes comments about his puffy shirt and everything, which immediately points out that he's from a time when puffy shirts were common. Also, the description of his family structure is a little odd, at least for our current sensibilities. One thing I did find kind of amusing, and this is weird, but sort of his abusive uncle is described as a wine drinker as opposed to, like, typically you would see in a more contemporary time this person either drinking beer or hard liquor or something like that. But this guy drinks wine. <laughs> That's what you found funny? Well, that and also I just kept thinking of the Seinfeld episode with the puffy shirt where he's like, but I don't want to be a pirate. And this actually made me think that the pirate from our initial interludes, like the story of the pirate in the cage, is a reference to Simon. And I think the cage is that elevator that takes him from the cottage. No comment. But these are just the connections that my brain made. Not having read the book before, I could be wrong. No comment. <laughs> Other observations that I noticed here. So he gets this cottage willed to him by his dead mother on his 18th birthday. Presumably dead mother. His absent mother. So at the back door of the cottage, he finds a elevator that takes him down to the harbor of the Starless Sea. And while he's exploring, he runs into Eleanor, or Lenore, as she introduces herself. I want to say something about that. I think it is perfectly fine and should be encouraged that you do not need to keep the name that you were given at birth if it no longer fits you. I didn't. It's not that hard to figure out what it used to be. I don't really want anyone to go looking. It's kind of rude, extremely rude. And I never want to be referred to by it ever again. And there is one person on this planet that can call me it and I won't tell them not to. And it is your 94 year old grandmother. That's it. Everyone else, my name is Phoenix. And it's a good name. Thank you. So they meet up, and he asks her for a book recommendation. And when she goes off to go get a book, 
it takes her about 10 minutes to come back, but for her, six months have passed. And this is our first clue that time passes differently in the harbor than it does on the surface. So it makes me wonder how much time is passing between visits for Zachary and Mirabelle. Yeah, it seems to move differently and not in even necessarily the same direction. <laughs> right. It also feels a little like these are two separate pieces of the harbor moving at different times. I kind of picture almost like a figure eight where you have an intersection where things meet and then they go off in a different direction and then they loop back around to meet again. One side of the figure eight may be bigger than the other. Yeah, it's timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly. Yeah, you get it. Jeremy Barry. Definitely has that feel. Then we return to the story of Zachary Ezra Rollins as he stumbles upon the burned place. Which we referenced in our last episode, I think. Unless I edited that part out because we didn't have a real explanation as to what the burned place was. But now we do. Yeah, he recognizes the dollhouse that he read about in Sweet Sorrows. But the rest of the place has been destroyed. He also recovers Sweet Sorrows from his coat and has it cleaned up by the kitchen. The book or the coat? The coat. So while Zachary is out exploring, he's accompanied by a Persian cat who I found absolutely enchanting. Persian cats are much like Himalayan cats, like your brother's cat with a little smushed face. Yes. Just being followed around by a cat that meows at you is it's one of the little pleasures in the world. Well, we are followed around our house quite often by a little cat that goes meow. For reference here, we're talking about our podcat Sokka, who is not really that little. <laughs> no, no, he's not. He's not fat, and he weighs about 20 pounds, which is about twice as much as our other cat. Well, and what's really funny is, like, anytime someone goes into the kitchen and starts cooking or doing something, the first thing he does is he just immediately walks up to them and starts meowing for attention, and it's so adorable. And so annoying. And I cannot be mad at him. Right, and then he'll get up on the counter and brow at you, and then he'll get up on the refrigerator and brow at you, and sometimes he'll reach out and try to grab you because our kitchen is tiny and he takes up a sixth of it. I've cataloged his utterances. So there's brow, and then there's meow, <laughs> and then there's meow wow. <laughs> yeah, I think he really does do the meow wow at you. Meow, meow, meow wow, I'm not sure. He does one of them at you while you're cooking. It's obnoxious, and it is a sign that the universe is smiling at me. I feel loved. And then, you know, he'll kind of galump around because he really lowers the bar for what can be considered cat-like grace. <laughs> yeah. And then he'll just kind of curl up, and he likes to make sure that he's touching both of us anytime he's curled up. Which you can't do if you're in the kitchen and I am not. Yep. Anyway, I think we should get back to the little smushy face. Yes. So the cat is the one who leads Zachary to the secret entrance to the burned place, which he enters by extinguishing a candle. And with that, the wall slides down and he's able to walk in. Now, full disclosure, both of us are enchanted as all get out by the idea of secret rooms and hidden staircases, and bookcases that lead into rooms, all these things. So much so that <laughs> this is what passes for our Saturday night entertainment, I guess. We watched the entire season of, what is it, brother versus brother, property brothers things, and I'm kind of embarrassed to acknowledge that. But... Holy buckets, a $5 million house. I can't wrap my mind around the idea of someone <laughs> spending more than our house, entire house budget for if we wind up buying a house on one room's renovation. 
So it's kind of the kaiju problem. It's so big that it ceases to have any meaning. But one of those houses has a lot of little secret areas that are accessed through a secret stairway or behind a bookcase. And both of us are just like, what can we do when we have a house to make a hidden area? Yeah, Jonathan and Drew Property certainly put a lot of their own money into these things. Well, I mean, I assume that is their last name, for they are the Property Brothers, are they not? Audience, we have had this conversation a few different times. And you laugh every time. I do. I'm trying not to. Because this is a stupid joke. But it's a funny joke, and that's all that counts. <laughs> anyway, let's go on and talk about the book. Upon returning to his room, Zachary discovers a little card with a Z on it and the following instruction. The Queen of the Bees has been waiting for you, tales hidden within to be told. Bring her a key that has never been forged and another made only of gold. There once was a man from Nantucket. Oh, please don't. <laughs> I mean, it has that meter. It does, but please don't. I won't. So next we have another interlude with Simon and Eleanor. So before Simon can return to the surface, Lenore lends him a copy of Sweet Sorrows. And he asks the keeper what the protocol is for book lending. So the keeper informs him that in order to take anything, presumably like a book, out of the Starless Sea, you have to leave something in return. So he leaves his broom. Weird thing to leave, but okay. I mean, he's probably only got what? His broom? His clothes? Pocket lint. What would you suggest? I mean, the weird part is that he's been carrying his broom the entire time. Okay. Says a person who has walked around our entire house chasing after a cat, holding the switch controllers because you paused when the cat started going nuts. I'm glad you find that charming instead of completely aggravating. <laughs> you gotta be careful about that. I've had it unpair. That's fair. So anyway, he takes the book back up to the surface and then goes to sleep in the cottage. And when Simon wakes up, the whole thing feels like a dream. Have you ever had one of those dreams where... Like, a whole bunch of stuff happens and you feel like this is your new reality now. I have had real feeling dreams. Not all of them good and that's about where that's going to be left. Fair. And it's kind of a relief to wake up and think, oh, well, none of that is real. Yay. But I haven't had the good kind of, this is incredibly weird, but it's my reality and I like it. So Simon's figuring this whole thing was just a bizarre, hazy dream until he looks over and sees, no, that's Sweet Sorrows. That's the book that Lenore gave him. And he rereads it again and is, of course, rather enchanted by it. And this serves as sort of an anchor almost that tells him, yeah, that experience I just had was completely real. So he wants to do it again. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, if there was a weird hidden stairway elevator thing hiding outside my back door, kind of like a TARDIS. Yeah, I'd do it again. With that, he returns to the Starless Sea. In search of his lost love of yesterday. And it definitely has that feeling of new infatuation. What is the term that I've used before? New relationship energy? Yeah, it's got a lot of that. Anyway, so Simon returns to the harbor. And <laughs> when he finds himself reunited with Eleanor, for her, a lot of time has actually passed. Several months, in fact. And immediately, as soon as they find a private room, brown chicken, brown cow happens. <laughs> I do like the fact that it's very sweet and not remotely detailed. 
I think those are things that you can give your own imagined details to in stories. I don't particularly like descriptions of parts and actions, to put it lightly. It makes me kind of squeaked out. But something that's sweet and romantic and they just are under a blanket together and get to enjoy each other's presence. Something that's comfortable. I prefer that. You can definitely tell that even with all of the new relationship energy involved, it's very much built on a sense of love and respect and compassion for one another. There's something pure about it. Of course, now we return to Zachary's story. So Zachary continues to go exploring in the harbor and he comes across a grand ballroom. The feeling that I get here is one of an empty space that used to be full and was designed to be full. It's kind of a liminal space at this point. Something that feels wrong because it's empty, because it shouldn't be. Yeah, it feels like going back to a dying massively multiplayer game. Yeah. Or just going to a dead section in one of those games, even if the game itself is still live. Draenor, anyone? <laughs> yeah, or I was going to say or Darnassus. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, Darnassus was dead even during vanilla. <laughs> yeah... Yeah. Where you have all of these massive sculptures that are designed to be social spaces where people can go and hang out and talk and chat and do commerce and everything. And then when you just see these places empty and dead silent, it can be really weird. It's the experience I had when I went back to Star Wars The Old Republic. Oof. It feels really strange to walk through the streets of Coruscant and there's nobody around. <laughs> Moving on. In the ballroom, Zachary re-encounters Mirabelle, who's... Sloshed? Yeah, she is. She's been enjoying some sparkling white wine. We don't know if it's actually champagne. And she asks if he wants a drink. He says he's more of a cocktail guy. So she orders him a sidecar from the kitchen, and it's pretty much perfect. Because the kitchen is almost like a replicator. It does have that feel. He really should just be ordering tea Earl Grey hot. <laughs> I mean, he does like his tea, so. And then we get our first real look at the Starless Sea and an explanation of how this is a harbor. The sea has been receding, and to me it feels a little like the nothing from the never-ending story. One of those people have stopped believing in fairy tales, in books, in story. And so in this case, it's the Starless Sea receding. And in the never-ending story, it's this force of nothingness erasing the story. Yeah, it felt to me like a great big empty chasm that goes on forever. Didn't feel much like a sea, more like a well. It feels very dark to me. It feels very... I think I said this before, much like kind of that void space in the good place between the bad place or the good place and Earth being guarded by Michael Malley. A little bit of that, yeah. He likes frogs. So next we get a little interaction between Simon and the Keeper. And this is where time starts to get explained. He understands that the further he goes out from the harbor time is going to work a lot more differently. And the harbor represents sort of an eddy within time where sometimes people from the past and people from the future can mingle. I'm kind of wondering if the painter is one such person. Then, knowing that his love is lost, Simon resolves that he is going to set out on the Starless Sea to find a place where the two can reunite. This really called to my mind the story of time and fate falling in love. I'm not sure which one is which, but that sense of two people that seem to really belong together, separated by the exigencies of time and fate and what have you. It's a lonely thing, but it's also beautiful. So next we return to the story of Zachary. 
So as he's walking back to his room, he overhears Mirabelle and the Keeper talking together, and maybe a little more than talking, and we discover that Mirabelle and the Keeper have something of a relationship of their own. What this calls to mind is when your roommates, who were not dating, we don't think, probably, we walked back into the apartment and they just separated from one another like the quickest I have seen two humans move. Like they teleported apart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be too mean. I mean, they did date at one point, so. Yeah, but at that point they weren't, right? Correct. When I had asked about that, they asked me to respect their ambiguity. That's perfectly fine. And I love love and I really don't care if people want to cuddle with people who they are not strictly romantically involved with. That's not a problem. It was just, if they had moved any faster, they'd have tunneled through the wall. <laughs> yeah, there was probably a sonic boom there somewhere. Honestly, it would have been fine. No reason to be embarrassed whatsoever if they were just cuddling. I'm pro cuddles. Me too. I love love. I love cuddles. I love affection. I love people showing affection to one another. So when Zachary gets back to his room, he starts thinking about his riddle, his limerick. He, so he starts thinking about these keys, one of gold and one that's never been forged. The gold key is a piece of jewelry that Mirabelle has given him. And the one that was never forged, well, that's that electronic key card that he had from his hotel up on the surface. It was never forged. It was cast in plastic and then encoded with an electronic pin code. So he decides he's going to take this to this bee statue. The one that in previous chapters, I'm not sure if we specifically called out, but Mirabelle was staring at and was wondering who left a glass of mead next to. Mead is quite delicious. That's your takeaway. Okay, moving on. <laughs> I like my women like I like my coffee. Covered in bees! I guess that was moving on. <laughs> moving on. So, <laughs> so Zachary returns to the statue with the gold key and the key card and places them in the statue's hands. And lo and behold, he hears the ominous scraping of stone. And behind the statue, he finds that a doorway has been opened. Yet another secret passageway. And we'll discuss this when we return to his story. So then we return to the ballad of Simon and Eleanor. Or in this case, mostly Eleanor and her baby. So it turns out that night of passion with Simon has... No, we don't need you to explain that sex led to baby. We aren't talking about the birds and the bees. We're just talking about bees. Okay. <laughs> so... Eleanor is here with her baby and trying to figure out how to raise this child all on her own. She's got kind of a mix between the naivete of a six-year-old and the body and mind somewhat of a very sheltered adult that was raised by books. Now, you can learn a lot from books, but you have to be reading the right books, obviously, for any of that to happen. Fortunately, the kitchen appears to have some pretty good parenting advice. And also the ability to send supplies. Right. Because, yeah, nothing prepares you for that. No. I'm not sure how, how she got on with a newborn, but that gets glossed over. So while trying to figure out what she's going to name the child, Lenore decides to ask the kitchen. Because the kitchen seems to know all of this stuff. And lo and behold, the answer comes back. Mirabelle. So then we check in on Dorian in a little interlude where we actually see his perspective on that meeting back at the Griffin between Kat and Lexi and Zachary. He is not so inconspicuously reading a book and staring at the trio and becoming rather infatuated by the young man that he was expecting to be a lot younger, which would have made it ooky. But now that he realizes that the guy is actually, you know, mid-twenties, it's not so ooky. 
This is also our first real peek into Dorian as a person, as opposed to a character in someone else's story. We get a sense that he's someone who's been around, he's seen a lot, done a lot, not all of it's stuff that he's proud of. In fact, a lot of it that he's not proud of. We also see that he catches on pretty quickly that Lexi and Kat are in a relationship with one another, which is just adorable. There are differences in how you act with someone that you are romantically involved with that I think are pretty physical and easy to pick up generally. Again, with that new relationship energy, I know a lot of people who have gone from being friends to being in a new relationship and then they just can't stop touching hands, back, shoulders, wanting to put their thighs next to one another when they're sitting on a couch, something like that. And the thing for me is that the most adorable people that you see doing this are older people that have been together for decades. I'm really looking forward to being like that with you. I like to think we still got some of that. As I put my foot on your knee, yes. We really do need to have a room where we don't sit on the floor to do our podcasts. We'll have to talk to the brother's property about that. Oh, dear Lord. That comes back. <laughs> Callbacks. Uh huh. We are rambling. I don't know what happened today, but that's what today is. Anyway, let's continue. So, moving on, after that, we get this brief one page poem about a stag in the snow. I kind of read the stag in the snow as a metaphor for Dorian. That is obviously a poetic reading, and so subject to personal interpretation. <laughs> what about you? So first off, I'm actually quite enchanted by the fact that this is a paper star folded from a page that was removed from a book. Again, it horrifies me. The idea of ripping pages out of books horrifies me. Defiling books. I hate it. But so I can see why you would think that this is a metaphor for Dorian. But I also think that this is more about taking chances. Also, that longing to have a deeper connection with other people, to have a deeper connection with at least one other person. Having been there myself, I can empathize. So then we return to the story of Zachary as he explores the crypt below the Queen of the Bees. And... I believe this is a Crypt of the Acolytes, which fits with the B iconography, obviously. And they're all wrapped in phrases of text. Some of them seem half familiar to me. So you're talking about the things like, he did not wish to be here any longer. Yeah. I think it's narrating his inner thoughts. Makes sense, because the Acolytes can't actually speak. He reads little bits and pieces. There are three things lost in time. A sword, a book, a man. Find the man. I'm not sure that these are meant to be callbacks. I think that this is meant to be communication. That is meant to be the next part of his quest, just to find that man lost in time. I think that's a reference to Simon. No comment. And with that, we end our reading this week. All right, so let's talk about characters of the week. So I picked Eleanor. Eleanor goes through quite a bit this week. So she starts off with her meeting this person and falling in love with them and then disappearing from their life for months at a time on her end and then having this passionate reunion and then suddenly finding herself with child and without really a whole lot of idea for what to do next. She's definitely led a very sheltered life. She hasn't had a whole lot of human interaction to help her navigate a lot of this stuff. So that she was able to do so speaks to her resourcefulness and also to the fortune she has to be in the harbor with access to the kitchen, especially. I'm sure that the painter that raised her had at least a little bit to do with helping her not accidentally suffocating said child. I think that the painter is Mirabelle. And I think that it's sort of a time loop thing where <laughs> Effectively, Mirabelle's her own grandma, sort of. No comment. 
You can take that however you want. I've read the whole book. I know whether you're right or wrong. That's fair. So yeah, I thought that Eleanor's arc was gripping and it really grasped the consequences of these sorts of wonderful romantic experiences. She has to cope with the fallout. It also calls back the story of the queen who falls in love with the blacksmith who then passes and then she has to raise their daughter. These stories of women who have to raise a child without any preparation. Though I think that the princess has a little more wherewithal than Eleanor, maybe. Agreed. Like I say, I think they're parallels. They're echoes of these stories throughout this book. I'm always impressed by the resilience of the people who find themselves in this situation and that they handle it with love and grace. So who do you have? So while we never actually described this part of the story for sake of wanting to get through our <laughs> book discussion, I've chosen Rhyme. Rhyme, along with the Persian cat, is one of Zachary's guides on his quest. She leaves the ballad of Simon and Eleanor out for Zachary to find. She knows she's being followed. She in no way thinks that Zachary is being sneaky, but she doesn't call him out on it. She has her own machinations. She has her own motivations. And I think there's probably a little bit of a thrill in leaving breadcrumbs that she knows are being followed. Well, I mean, he's the first person she's seen in a while that's not the Keeper or Mirabelle, so... True. But I think there's a little bit of wisdom in getting someone to do a thing without expressly asking them to do said thing. Especially when you want them to come to their own conclusions. Not in the same way as being dad. <laughs> it's not in that just chuck a fishing rod at someone and expect them to learn how to cook a fish. But it's more like, okay, you're living for the thrill of adventure and mystery and curiosity and learning. You're going to be more receptive to you thinking you're clever than me just giving you the information. So that's what happens. I love that line where Zachary's like, is this a main quest or a side quest? <laughs> Because that's how he's seeing this whole thing. Like his quest log is just rapidly filling up with things and he has no idea how they're all connected. But he knows he's got to do them all. So that was very smart on, uh, on Rhyme's part there. So now let's talk about game recommendations. This week, because it's all about puzzles, we thought we'd find puzzle games. My puzzle game recommendation is a little unorthodox, but hear me out. It's the Football Manager series. Nope, nope, that tracks go ahead so every game really is a puzzle game of a sort you have to figure out how to fit together a group of disparate pieces to make an outcome that you want to achieve and football manager does this by giving you a spreadsheet of players and then a series of tactical instructions that you can give them and then you just have to watch them do their thing without any direct input on your end it ends up being a tactical shouting simulator eventually but there is definitely a puzzle mechanic to it as you're figuring out all of the transfer regulations and contracts and figuring out tactical schemes that work, how different players are going to fit together based on their attributes, and how you can turn your League One side into Champions League champions of the world. It's all about figuring out how to unlock these combinations, how to get the right players, when you start off, you figure that the secret is just figuring out how to sign Zlatan Ibrahimovic or Messi or whatever. And while that seems really sexy at first, it ends up being a problem because they're really expensive. And while you score a lot of goals, your actual defensive output isn't that great. Turns out the real secret is figuring out how to establish a complete squad that works together well, both on offense and defense. Much like real football clubs. Yes. Again, it's a, a challenge to figure out this puzzle, and depending on which team you're playing in and which league you're in, it can be more or less difficult to figure that puzzle out. You're going to have games where you fail spectacularly, but that doesn't mean that 
your overall save is completely blown, still have more games to play. And so you got to figure out how to then respond to all of these new challenges. So yeah, that's my pick. I really like that you pointed out that all games are really puzzle games of a sort. Because combat in games is its own sort of puzzle. There are some times where you can just brute force it, button mash. And for some games, that works beautifully. And in other games, that's how you fail over and over and over again. Some people, me, do not have the patience to figure out combat puzzles, combat mechanics down to that level, or the, maybe patience is the wrong word for me, the ability while you're being pummeled to figure out the answer to the puzzle. That's just not me. So my puzzle game recommendation is The Witness, which takes the idea of puzzle solving and just for the most part, you have no timer. There isn't figure out this puzzle while I'm going to like pummel you and your game is going to be over. It's very, very clever person makes very, very clever game TM. And I know that a lot of people get frustrated with that. I gently describe it as a loving journey up Jonathan Blow's ash hole. I enjoy clever designers, clever authors a little more, I think, than maybe you do, because I also fancy myself to be not on par, but at least trending that direction as a game designer, or that's what I aspire to be. I find a lot of joy in figuring out what was in the designer's head, not in other places. So I know that the game is a number of years old at this point, but when I first started playing it, the experience of the game itself, I love it. It's beautiful. It's clever in the ways that make me tick. But the other thing about it that I really enjoyed was that when I got stuck and finally gave in and went looking for answers for some of the puzzles that I just couldn't get, the community around that game cared about other people's experience with the game. So much so that every potential spoiler was kept under a bubble wrap of, are you sure you want to know what this is? I'm not going to show you all of what this is. I'm just going to give you a little incremental step by step so that you can figure it out on your own once you get past this little block. The community cared about the experience, the UX, the thing that really makes me so happy about this game, the way that so much thought and detail was put into this game. And that in itself was just amazing. Sometimes you'll wind up on a YouTube rabbit hole for a game that is story-based and you want to find out a little bit about a part of it that is like beginning, and then you wind up accidentally spoiling it for yourself or parts that you didn't want to spoil for yourself. Or sometimes you have a person who was a history minor living in your house and can figure out everything about the game about Greek gods as you're playing it and you would like to discover it from the game and it doesn't happen because somebody blurts it out. Anyway, <laughs> don't know what that's about. If you haven't played The Witness, this is a game that I spent like 90 hours on. I'm not saying I'm good at it because clearly I did not grok all the puzzles quickly, but it was compelling to me and it was fun. And all of the hidden things, all of the details that are placed in that game from perspective shifts, from auditory puzzles, the beautiful color palette, the care with which every element was created and the care with which the audience for that game treated their peers. I don't know how it would be to play it now, picking it up while so many people have already solved all the puzzles, if it's 
quite as guarded and taken care of. But it was a really fun thing for me to play through, especially when it came out, because it was right around the time that I was finishing up DigiPen. We're going to go ahead and move on to game experiences. We did it out of order to cater to this for me. My game experience is with The Witness. We have some friends who are also game designers that are the curious sort, let's say, who also are like the QA sort, quality assurance ostensibly, but also my goal is to break this. And like five or six puzzles in, one of our friends broke it. And that lovely game experience, that discovery, that UX, that going through and finding all the clevernesses was broken. And I feel very bad for our friends who would have probably really enjoyed it if they had had the same timeline of experience with that game that I did. Almost every puzzle in The Witness is there is a circle and a line and you have to get from one circle, follow the line to another circle or to another outcome or something. Something that I think if I were designing it, that I would have maybe quantum ogred a little bit. I would have maybe like prevented from happening. I wouldn't have allowed this particular clever puzzle to have been found before the player gets out into the real world of the game. Because before our friends got out to the real world of the game to discover all of the bits that would have made this part comprehensible, they found a secret area that makes no sense, that ruins the entire thing. But our friend is that person. Our friend is the person that goes, oh, I wonder if I can do this. Yes, you can do that. You shouldn't have. But like as a game designer, I would have probably turned that particular puzzle off or made a way that that didn't exist until after other parts had been triggered. Although I have to say, we say that the experience was ruined, but from the perspective of our friend, he thought he was terribly clever and was really amused with himself. He was both terribly amused at himself, but his wife was kind of upset <laughs> Because she wanted to experience the game and I wanted them to experience the game. And on the other hand, he also was a little bit upset because that meant that he didn't ever get to have that first impression of the witness the way that I had or the way that a lot of other people had. So in that way, the cleverness of the game kind of bit itself in the butt. <laughs> And I wonder how many other people had that particular experience. Yeah, they ended up effectively starting the journey looking at the back of Jonathan Blow's teeth. Thanks. You're welcome. Would you like to talk about your game experience? So mine is another live D&D &D experience. And this one was a game under the stars. I loved that game. Oh. Me too. So this was the first nice day of the summer, and I was hosting our regular Friday night game, and so we decided, hey, let's move our dining room table out onto the back patio, and then we'll play out there, and then we'll set up like a lamp outside so that we can actually have light so we can see what we're doing. And we all went out, we ran our game, and it was just so much fun to play because it was warm out. So, you know that feeling, the first night when it's warm enough out that you don't have to wear a jacket or anything like that? It, it was that night, and the stars were out, you know, we had good food, and then afterwards, we realized that we hadn't actually gotten rid of our Christmas tree from that year, so we then burned it in our barbecue. Okay, so it was outside in your backyard. It yeah. was not in the house. 
it was outside in the backyard and I don't know that you were strictly responsible for that remaining there no. that long. No, I, I wasn't strictly responsible for that, but I wasn't not not responsible. Okay. But at any rate, we set up this little bonfire in the barbecue grill with the remains of this desiccated and dried out Christmas tree. And I remember, did we roast s'mores? I think we did. I'm pretty sure we had s'mores. I'm pretty sure that we found other things to set on fire that were food related. That was just such a fun night. Like just sharing that with you and our friends. Your roommates. Yep. That was a pretty magical night. I had a great time with it. I remember all of us were just really smiling at it just because it was something so different. And it really underscores oftentimes just how your physical setting can make a huge difference in your game experience. You know that this means that when we make whatever outdoor living space we have, I'm going to make sure that it is amenable to playing D&D &D under the stars. Same. So that was my experience. We move on now to book recommendations. Do you want to kick that one off or shall I? I think because mine is not strictly upbeat that it might be best if you go first. Okay. I picked The Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison. This is something of a courtroom intrigue drama in a high fantasy world where there is a long-standing conflict between goblins and elves and it's the tale of the 13th son of the most recent emperor who is half goblin by birth his mother was a goblin who was selected to be the new queen as a way to reconcile the two nations and he's been raised in exile but due to a quirk of birth he's the natural heir after a horrific accident it really deals with how does a person who strives to do the right thing and to be equitable fit in with a system that is designed around inequality? And how does that person effectively use their privilege, which is grossly unearned, to affect the lives of people who don't have that privilege? How can they be a better ally? How can they make the system work better? It really reminds me a lot of that line in Black Panther where it is very hard for a good person to be king. And this really examines that hard. It talks about how these systems oftentimes take people who would otherwise be good people and turn them into monsters. And it's only through effort that they can actually be good and use their power for the greater good. It's a reminder about how systems are the things that ultimately will decide how we're remembered and it's about how well we use those systems and engineer them that will determine what our future looks like so yeah that's my recommendation it's both challenging and hopeful so give it a shot all right i know i've talked about my book recommendation before but it's one that I just can't get out of my head, especially right now with the state of the world. It was a little bit too intense to recommend, I think, in the latter half of 2020. But I have a little more hope now, a little less existential dread now. And I hope that a lot of other people see that hope, that good coming back enough where they can take the time to examine their feelings about what has happened in the world this past year, past four years. And maybe, just maybe, if you read this book and it encourages you to affect changes, that will have increased the good. And it's Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. A lot of people pass around the meme of 1984 and Brave New World and Animal Farm and Handmaid's Tale and all these other post-apocalyptic, mostly largely written by white people books that describe 
the state of the world, like the you are here Venn diagram of all of these kind of bleak worlds. And I'd like to say that Parable of the Sower fitting with those in that genre is one of the most true and real feeling of how we slowly slip into it, slowly slip into the madness as a society that has gone down the inevitable path of following populists, authoritarian governments, how looking for someone to take control and force us down a path because we just can't put forth the energy to affect change for the better. And I like that it has a perspective that is somewhat alien to myself as the characters in it are largely people of color. I think that it is an important read and I think that we need to make a concerted effort to include authors that do not look like us in our recommendations because we cannot learn about things that are unfamiliar to us if we refuse to seek them out. I also don't want it to fall into the Rolodex problem of everything that everybody knows is written by a white dude because everything that everybody knows is written by a white dude and that's the only thing that they can recommend. Especially when it comes to sci-fi, especially when it comes to near future examinations of our current selves. And that's one of the reasons why every time anyone brings up George Orwell or brings up Margaret Atwood, I am the annoying person that says, read Parable of the Sower. I handed it to your dad because somebody recommended something to him to read that was largely white privilege perspective. And I'm like, uh, uh, this one. And he read it. He didn't necessarily enjoy it because I wouldn't put the word enjoy along with that story because it is a pretty bleak world, but he found value in it and he appreciated my recommendation of it. He was glad he read it, even though he was not glad that it was as resonant as it was, just because that spoke to the darkness we were seeing and still are seeing. By the time that this podcast comes out, things may be a little bit different and a little bit more hopeful, crossing our fingers so hard. So let's dig ourselves out of the darkness a little bit and focus on our quotes from this much more lighthearted, carefree book. All right, I'll start us off. I'm here to sail the starless sea and breathe the haunted air. That kind of makes me think, because you did have a little flub up that I am taking out in the editing, but that kind of reminds me of a tongue twister. I love to be beside your side, beside the sea, beside the seaside, by the beautiful sea. I don't know why that just went in my head when you just went la la la. I don't know why either. But that just really captured that sense of adventure and romance that sense of boundless possibility. And it, I think, captures something about Zachary's spirit and the things that drive him. He wants to explore. He wants to see something he's never seen before. He wants to experience this haunted air that's filled with these ghosts of past adventures and maybe write some adventures of his own. It just really spoke to me. I think it's a really good quote. What did you have? I much like always, have two. One because I'm cheeky and one because I thought it was beautiful. I am not a cat. When Simon and Eleanor were flirting by sending notes back and forth under the door, Eleanor asks if Simon is a cat. It's just, I am not a cat. I find that enchanting, just having to explain that I am not a cat. That's what a cat would want you to think. Sokka would want you to think. But he'd more likely say, Brow. anyway, as for the quote that I think is a little more 
poignant and or beautiful and or quote worthy. <laughs> there is a story here for each bubble in each bottle, in every glass, in every sip. And when the wine is gone, the stories will remain. And I think that that's an important thing to remember. When the experience is over, what we have left is our stories of it. You can always come back to a story. The stories are not gone. Man, that D&D &D game was something like nine years ago. More than that. Yeah, it was 2010, I think. Yeah, and so that story isn't gone. That D&D &D game, that campaign, long over. But the story isn't gone. And I think it's important to remember that the stories we form in our lifetime do not just disappear, whether for good or for ill, hopefully more for the good. With that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thank you for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us next week on Tales from the Waystone, a starless interlude, where we will be covering pages 328 through 405 of the U.S. paperback edition of The Starless Sea. We would like to extend a huge thank you to our friend Shawnee Jang for our theme music, and to Aaron Morgenstern, who has created this harbor on the Starless Sea that we have enjoyed exploring. Writing and project management, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. And audio production and editing, as well as social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. If you'd like to help support us, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash waystonepod. There you can get early access to our episodes, as well as exclusive Patreon-only goodies, such as bonus pods and artwork and other fun stuff. And as always, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. So the Quantum Ogre is a role-playing game strategy that DMs can employ to subtly railroad players without players knowing they've been railroaded. The idea works like this. You have two doors. Behind one of those doors is an ogre. But no matter which door you choose, the DM is always going to say that that's the one that the ogre was behind all along. The DM wants to make sure that this ogre encounter happens because the DM doesn't actually make the ogre happen until it's there. So the idea is that once a quantum ogre pops into existence, it exists everywhere you turn. Movement in the presence of a quantum ogre always provokes an opportunity attack, and any creature which encounters it continues to encounter it until it dies or the creature does. Fortunately, this means that the quantum ogre is always considered to be within range of any attack or spell, and attacks made against it automatically hit. So it's basically just a giant floating blob of hit points that <laughs> you can throw at your players. It's generally considered to be kind of mean because it takes away player agency, but randomness takes away player agency all the time. That's what a die roll does. You want to pull off this awesome attack, but guess what, player agency? Too bad, you rolled a one. It's the same basic idea. It's using the DM, though, in this case, instead of the die, to limit player agency in some fashion. Now, in this case, it also is a way that the DM can try to trick the player into believing that they did have agency all along. And it's also a way to prevent yourself from falling into that trap where you plot out a specific direction in the map, a set of things just to the east of where the player is, and the players decide, nah, never mind that, let's go west. <laughs> this lets you basically superimpose whatever you had said in one direction into the other. And I am that DM. I do that all the time. I give you choices and you wind up going to the one I wanted in the first place because I just moved it from one door to the next. Jerk. Not always. In your defense, it does make it a lot less annoying when your players decide to go off in a random direction. Right, but sometimes when your players want to go off in a random direction, you teach them why you don't go off in a random direction. You make up players whose names are the name of the fan that is right next to you. Lasco. <laughs> Never done that before.
<sighs> I didn't plan this. What's its name? Panasonic. <laughs> <laughs> Black and Decker Pet Eraser. <laughs> right. Orange Amp. I don't know. 